course. Come out. You want to mention it. Yeah. Thank you, Henrietta. <laughs> Welcome to New React to New React. To New I'm Alan Steinfeld, and I am back on another live show today. It's really exciting that um, this is my third show of the day. So if you're keeping track, uh, watch everything you, that's come out on this channel. But I have a very exciting guest tonight, uh, Michael Grosso. He is going to be appearing at Contact in the Desert, which is upcoming July... Um, it is upcoming. It is my contact in the desert flyer? I'll have to get to that. But it's upcoming June 24th to the 28th. Go to contactinthedesert.com. And let me just see if I could bring up the flyer for contact in the desert, the, the ad, because it is really a great gathering. I've been going there um, since 16 and it is the biggest gathering of people involved in the UFO community. And I think it, it, when it was live, it was quite a beautiful event. This is the first time it is not going to be live. It's online. So, okay, I'm going to just play a little promo because one of the reasons I'm interviewing Michael today is that he's going to be one of the keynote feature speakers there. And they've been trying to promote this for contact. So, here is a little roll in, a little commercial from Contact in the Desert. Let me just put this up here and here and here. And you see that. And we're going to go to sound. And this is Contact in the Desert. When you start to ask the question, it unfolds the fabric of space itself, how it's made. What is it made of? We're not alone in this universe. We never have been. Alien intelligences have cohabited with us on this planet for millions of years. We inherited the obsession from the Anunnaki. Anyone that still thinks that we're the ones that are obsessed with gold does not know enough about the true history of our species, how we came to be here, and the conditions that brought us here. We are not unique in this universe. Extraterrestrials do exist. We are, so to say, the copies of them. Okay, so that is coming up in um, in June. Be there uh, or online. Go to Contact in the Desert. Oh, oh sorry. And then um, we're going to proceed with one of uh, the speakers from there, Michael Grosso, who is a philosopher. Let me just let Michael into the room, this other guy named Michael. Is that a friend of yours, Henrietta? Michael Okay, so Michael Grosso is a philosopher. He's taught philosophy. He's an artist. But what I like most about his work is that he takes an intelligent approach to the paranormal and phenomena. And he's he's written he's been part of lots of um, lots of anthologies. He's written a bunch of books. His latest is a uh, one of the latest is about the levitating saint. Uh, what was the name of that saint, uh, Michael? Grosso uh, from Cupertino. Yeah. And, and you understand it as 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 not someone who's who writes it off and saying it's uh, just uh, made up. You go into the mysteries and miracles and and like most intelligent people try to make sense of it. So um, tell us your position about the paranormal and and where intelligence really fits into the understanding of this other phenomena, including UFOs, of course. Well, you know, I, I, I have had sporadically is the exact word throughout my life, inexplicable experiences starting from, I don't know, maybe uh, eight years old. I can, I remember the first ESP experience I had, but one of the most important experiences I ever had that I'm still thinking about, and I think about it frequently is a UAP, I, 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 a, an unidentified uh, uh, <clears throat> light, essentially, phenomenon. I did not see a craft. I don't believe that, I don't know, 
crafts are involved here quite, I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but <clears throat> what I saw was something that somehow I would call it a mind incarnate in the way it behaved. But it, it did as many uh, mystical uh, paranormal types of phenomena manifest through light. And uh, I'll mention, I'll just describe the experience very briefly. I was living in Greenwich Village with my girlfriend in 1971 and I had just gotten my PhD in philosophy. And it was, a, it was her birthday on uh, April 23rd. It happens to be Shakespeare's birthday too. <laughs> And 11 o'clock at night, uh, uh, we were listening to John Coltrane's Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And that may sound religious, but man, it's a, one of the most super advanced pieces of jazz that I've ever heard. And we were listening, wrapped uh, to that. And I got up uh, and went to the window. It was a clear night and uh, at 11, about 11 o'clock, and I looked out the window and suddenly uh, I was sort of beating my foot, just gazing into the sky, listening to the music. And suddenly these lights appeared right in front of me outside. I, I lived, I was on this, we were on the sixth floor uh, uh, on a street in Greenwich Village. And there are these lights dancing. I use the word dancing because it seemed like they were dancing in unison with the music and with me. <clears throat> and I... I I had a, 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 an impression of a face, a human face or figure that was kind of grooving with me, smiling like, wow, isn't this cool? And yeah, sure, right? It, it was very cool indeed, but that was the feeling I had and, and also baffled. So I said, Jane, come to the window. I want you to see something. She raised the window sensibly to make sure it was not some weird uh, reflection, saw the same thing and we watched it move around for a couple of seconds, and then it shot over to the dome of Our Lady of Pompeii, a church in Greenwich Village. And from the top of that dome, it beamed at us. It was like going at us with these lights going on and off for several seconds. And the two of us just gaping with absolute, you know, speechless wonder. And then it, the lights took off and went in a, the classic UFO zigzag motion and vanished over the entire Empire State Building in about a half a second. Uh, and we, and the whole room seemed sort of lit up and electrified. And I said, let's go up on the roof. I don't know why I wanted to go up on the roof because we were on the top floor. And lo and behold, there's Louis on the roof and he's looking at it and he says, did you see that? So there's a third witness. He also saw it. Louis, coincidentally, was a guy that I had just turned on to uh, uh, John Coltrane. He had never heard of Coltrane, and he was a young drummer. And I said, you got to get into Coltrane, right? And uh, so that was the experience. Uh, and I have been pondering that. It's, it clearly had a religious overtone. Uh, Why did it have a religious overtone? What was religious about it? And the Son and the Holy Ghost. There's the music. Oh. It's not oh. classical. It wasn't. It wasn't Palestrina. <laughs> it was John Coltrane. But maybe that's what religion in 20. Well, this was 1971. Uh, but at any rate, uh, yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, and the other thing was that it shot over to the Dome of Our Lady of Pompeii, which is a Catholic mm. church. So what could be plainer? It was somehow indicating to me, but what was it indicating? Mm -hmm. See, well, I've had all kinds of strange experiences, many that you can't even put into categories. I have to mm -hmm. come up with new categories. Mm -hmm. But speaking for myself, why that experience was so important and why the whole pattern of paranormal experiences, I've came, I basically came to the conclusion that something was involved in simply trying to tell me that all thing, or all these things were real, not explaining why or how, not engaging me to involve myself in any process of conversion or whatever. It was just a manifestation of uh, ideas and realities, new realities, if you will, <laughs> strange right. realities right. that were uh, completely strange. Now, I did have an immediate reaction, and it was this. 
this was a signal from the universe being as vague as I can hopefully be. I just got a PhD. That means I'm doctor. Doctor uh -huh. in Latin means wise. Uh -huh. so I got uh -huh. the idea that the message was, hey, you think you're wise, buddy? Figure this out. And I've been trying mm -hmm. to figure it out since 1971. And of course, I'm not the only one. I learned a few, uh, a few other things. So well, that, that's how I got launched into the UFO uh, part of the, of the story. But we're all here to figure something out. And, uh, um, but you've also seen other miracles. Can you talk about some of the other miracles well, you've seen? Yeah, and you, I, I, I would call levitation the way I use the word miracle. I don't use the word miracle as implying a religious intervention. Right. <laughs> I just use it as a term to point to an extraordinary, inexplicable phenomenon that materialistic science cannot figure out. Uh, so, for example, <clears throat> uh, I taught, team taught a course in unusual phenomena in a class once with, with a, a fellow philosopher. <clears throat> And we studied, uh, you know, all kinds of things, the, the paranormal, uh, meditation, uh, Hindu philosophy, and so on. And one of the students one day suggested, why don't we do an experiment that we, that I used to do when I was a kid called, uh, uh, what is it, the phrase, uh, uh, light as a feather, okay? And, and what this consists of, I never heard of it that kids get together, apparently girls like to do it because it was all girls that knew about this. They get together and they kind of chant or touch each other in a certain way and then they try and they say lift. And there's a kind of, uh, and then a, a, a kind of levitation takes place. So I never heard of this. And I said, well, let's do it right now. And we had time and that's what we were there for. And uh, so I picked out the heaviest guy in the class. Uh, an ex-Marine who weighed at least 200 pounds. Massive guy, smart and massive. And he put him on a chair right in the middle of the classroom. And I selected four of the daintiest looking ladies that did not look like they would be particularly strong. And I had them just put two fingers underneath the knees and underneath the elbows. Now we had been chanting and meditating together. So there was a reason why we probably had the rapport to pull this off. I can assure you, I didn't expect anything to happen. I said, all right, we'll try, give it a shot. And so we did a little chanting, a little breathing, and I said, lift. And those four ladies without effort emphasized, there was no pressure and they were not like, ah. You know what it's like to raise a guy 200 pounds? That's something else. They didn't make any effort. They just touched him. And when I said lift, up he went as far as they could reach. Wow. And I was completely flabbergasted. And I, I, I never forget the look on this guy's face. I can still see it in my mind's eye. <laughs> I mean, a lot are like, whoa, you know? And then they let go of him and he just gently you would think he was up in the air. I mean, raised several feet in the air. You would think a heavy guy like that once, you know, when on the downfall part of the experiment, he might come down rapidly like a, like a feather, light as a feather. He just floated down. So <clears throat> now that, it was a pretty striking experience. And that's one of the reasons that I got into the study of levitation. It, my whole approach is, yes, my stance. I like to go for the most fantastic and the most challenging and the most incredible stuff as long as I have good evidence for it. I'm not interested in fantasy. Well, I am interested in fantasy. Fantasy is part of our, but I mean, so I thought levitation uh, is such a shockingly counterintuitive idea, uh, you know, suspending the basic, the basic, force of nature. I mean, if you look into the physics of it, it's gravity. Gravitation is what holds the universe together and is stopping it from expanding at this amazing rate that it is, as a matter of fact. So <clears throat> I, I got into the research on levitation and I found that uh, beside it happening 
in contexts like I was dis, uh, dis experienced, and there are other all kinds of weird contexts uh, where ordinary people have levitational experiences. Then I got into the literature of mediumship and 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 particularly the Catholic and and many of the uh, Buddhist uh, saints. They're all have the wonderful descriptions and written accounts and eyewitness testimony uh, supporting the reality of, uh, of, of levitation in, in various degrees. I decided to research the most famous levitator among the Catholic saints. The reason is there was lots of data, uh, lots of information that I could study and, and uh, build, build a case for it. So I ended up writing two books uh, on him. <clears throat> the first book uh, is about his life and his, uh, his uh, achievements and the whole, the general idea of levitation and the paranormal and how it relates to sainthood. But the second book, uh, we translated the biography of Joseph, which- uh, actually, What's his name? Joseph of Cupertino, oh, is that? Cupertino, yeah. It, Cupertino. It, it, it's not, it's Cupertino in, in California because of the Spanish influence. <laughs> but it's C O P in, in the. And th this is what year did that book come out? What, what year is he levitating? Oh, he, uh, well, he was born in um, 1603 and lived 60 years. And the moment he became a priest, as though he got a license, he could do this stuff and get away with it now, right? He became a priest. <laughs> And he, that was the sound that I've been hearing, by the way. But that's, that's, okay. that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, that's fine. Not gonna stop us. No. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, Joseph uh, for 35 years, continuously, although I think to be exact, there was, there was a two year period where he was slightly down spiritually and as it were, physically too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for 35 years, he astonished uh, not only all of Italy, but people came from all over Europe uh, to witness him, not only because he was a spectacular healer, levitator, and annoyingly uh, telepathic. You, you couldn't hang around a guy and he knew what you was thinking. And this fellow, fellow brethren used to say, hey, go easy, Joseph, be a little more, you know, what is the word? Uh, uh, indirect in your right. in your revelations about our uh, secret thoughts, you see. So uh, he he was uh, well, a, a quite an a, a extraordinary a character, and he his levitations were so unpredictable that he couldn't do any. He couldn't even perform a mass probably. In the middle of a mass, he'd be hovering in the air, and everyone would just be staring at him floating in the air rather than paying attention to the words. How, how high would he levitate? Would it be to the ceiling or what? what, what oh, how? I know of one beautiful and very entertaining story of him landing on top of an olive tree, <laughs> hovering on a, on a little branch like a bird. And, and he sort of landed on the top of his tree after uh, an unconscious rapture, as it were, because he didn't even know where he was and how to get down from the tree. So uh, he, he said, would someone bring a ladder and help me come down? <laughs> I don't remember exactly. So wait, so let me just ask you, would it come upon, come upon him because his states of consciousness were sort of expanded and joyous? Was that absolutely. sort of? Absolutely. Uh, I, he, I remember specifically, I paid close attention to the narratives. And on one case, which I, I love, he's walking along with one of his brother monks mm -hmm. and the monk looks up into the beautiful blue sky and says how beautiful God's sky is and that was enough <laughs> to ignite ecstasy now this is the key for the psychological key to understanding levitation uh, it, it is almost invariably not almost certainly invariably in the case of Joseph that his levitations were always preceded by two things one a usually a quick state of ecstasy that would seize him. And the moment that happened, he'd let out with a bloody scream that would scare the daylights out of people. 
and then up he would go. Wait, he what, would what go. was the scream? Was that a voluntary scream or involuntary? Involuntary. involuntary. I mean, the oh. excitement apparently, I, I, you know, in a sport, for example, when you do a good shot, mm-hmm. something, you might just let out with a noise, a scream. Right, right. Or, right. or if you're suddenly happy. I, I'll tell you about a scream. When I heard that uh, um, Biden became president, I was alone in my house. Mm-hmm. I did something totally unexpected and that I never do. I let out with a blood curdling, joyous scream of delight. They must have mm-hmm. heard me 10 blocks away. Oh, good. Totally involuntary. I, I didn't love it. I'm glad Steve's not listening because he wouldn't have liked uh, this fr- a friend who joins us sometime. But anyway, right. so, okay. So he lets out a scream. He, go, he goes in text. He lets out a scream and then he lifts off the ground. Right, right. And, and but what's happening as far as I can make out, and this is only a partial hypothesis, mm-hmm. but very clearly, if you study the literature of all of the mystics of all, of all of, of the different faiths, and if you study the mediums, mm-hmm. it's a state of mind that the state of ecstasy is very interesting. Ecstasis literally means standing outside yourself, right? Stasis, standing, ek, out. And what that fundamentally means, as far as I can see, is that the ordinary everyday content of our consciousness, which is normally riveted upon everyday life, challenging or not challenging, uh, habitually, emotionally, and intellectually, our consciousness is riveted on mundane matters, matters Mm -hmm. that concern the survival of our own bodies and life and happiness. The mystics and the masters of levitation, as far as I can see, uh, are experts at eliminating that everyday consciousness through prayer, Mm -hmm. meditation, through concentration. Uh, The yoga descriptions of Patanjali, uh, I think are perfectly, you know, effective and accurate. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Mm -hmm. it's as though there's some kind of a force that enters us or can enter our, our minds and bodies when we unblock, unclutter ourselves. And the nature of that force is such that it can countervail the effect of, 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 gravi- of gravitation itself and put mm-hmm. you in a s- space that's more like a mental space, a dream space. And as we know, in dreams, we can fly and we can do all kinds of... But, you know, it's related to the UFO experience as well, because yeah. I actually take your experience. You were probably having a really high time listening to jazz with this woman and, you know, you were in a high state. So could you relate? that to and other people can jump I, into I, I think so because you know I we were madly in love with each other and uh, and we were just this was ecstatic we were having a good time that that night I remember mm-hmm. but when this manifestation took place uh, we were relaxed and and just listening to me although it's hard to relax when you listen to John Coltrane right uh, in, in a way but, but- um, I think that yes, we were we were in a highly receptive state. There were a number of coincidences. Uh, it was two days after my birthday. It was right after I got my PhD. Uh, it was Jane's birthday. Mm. Uh, it was spring. It was love. It mm-hmm. was uh, a beautiful night. I remember it was a crystal clear blue night, mm. and somehow. I mean, it totally baffles and me. I feel that we drew whatever that reality was to us. I don't mm-hmm. believe that these entities are floating around in the universe and telepathically they say, hey, there's Grosso, he's into John Coltrane with his girlfriend. <laughs> Let's go pay him a visit and, and, and give him a, you know, a marvelous shot or something. It's hard for me to believe that. Mm. The whole thing is hard to believe. True enough, but I somehow feel that there was something in that coordination of our experience at that night that the whole bunch of variables came together and it was such that it created a signal to a source of intelligence that was able to register and pick it up and then 
perform the act that uh, that we experience. I mean, three of us saw this thing. Yeah. If me by myself, I might have thought, well, this is a re residual effect of some weed I was smoking, but uh, not with mm. not with three people. Well, let me ask some of these panelists here to jump in um, and welcome Michael Rossart. Thanks for joining us here. Um, well, um, David, you have some, or Henrietta, or, or um, jump in here because I, I, you kind of bring up a lot of points of discussion. Go ahead, David. I thought I think it's interesting, uh, Michael, what you're talking about about being the the experience being drawn to you, because um, that's something that Willie Strieber talked about with his experience um, that led to communion. Mm -hmm. Was he'd been doing the Gurdjieff work mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. for a long time, and he'd been doing a lot of meditation, and especially a sensing meditation. Um, which is actually really similar to the um, neophyte meditations in the AMRC uh, work and uh, similar to some of the Dzogchen uh, meditations in that. And he said that when he had his experience, one of the things that he later learned from what he calls the visitors is that they were drawn to him because they said he was glowing like, mm. a, like a beacon, you know. So, th so that was really interesting to hear your, ex your description of that. Because it sounds very similar, you know. Well, what you say is interesting because there was this, the, the two parts of what, what uh, we saw, everyone saw the UFO and the lights. Only I saw the, this figure, this man. Mm -hmm. And he was doing exactly, he was expressing what you've just said, uh, David, in that he seemed to be like just saying, isn't this cool? Isn't right. this And that's what I felt, you know. I mean, I we were feeling like that to begin with, but... Uh, it, it was a, an affirmation, uh, but with an underlying message that seemed to relate to Christianity uh, because of the title of the music. On the other hand, it didn't feel like a message to convert to the Catholic doctrine, uh, which I couldn't do. I can't believe the, the theology, but I can believe the spirit, the feel of it. And, and uh, so that, I, you know, like Socrates, I, he's sort of one of my heroes. Uh, he never alienated himself from the spiritual tradition mm -hmm. of his culture, but at the same time, he was a, an intellectual revolutionary who launched the intellectual rational revolution of the Western world. But you know, yeah, he, he, he was, but... He was a mystic. I was going to say Socrates was a mystic besides a brilliant intellect. Well, he had, throughout his life, he had this uh, diamond that right. he kept in company, but it was a very eccentric diamond. You must know it never told him what to do. It only inhibited him. Mm -hmm. It stopped him from doing dangerous things. And it also stopped his friends when, when he was with his friends, they, uh, his uh, diamond would tell him, and don't go that way because you're going to be splashed by a wild pig. And it happened, <laughs> something like that. Right. But, uh, but the th interesting thing, yeah, about, about, uh, uh, about Socrates mm -hmm. was that when he was condemned by the Athenian court and had to go and confront and talk about uh, his condemnation, he never got a, a message from his diamond not to go or to avoid it. And he mm -hmm. inferred from that after they pronounced the death sentence on him that death was perfectly all right. And he went mm -hmm. to his death calmly and serenely because he got no indication that he should bother to avoid his fate. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have escaped easily. But easily. So he, but so as a rationalist and you as a kind of a rational mind as well, and, you know, also steeped in the classics and a mystic, what do you make of these miracles? Is there a way to explain it, perhaps in laws of physics that we don't understand at this point? Well, clearly we don't understand how right. levitation is possible. We don't know how a... Um, some saintly people, their bodies remain intact for years and sometimes radiate gorgeous smells. Mm. I mean, there's so many bizarre, I mean, that's one of the really fascinating phenomena on the odor of sanctity, because mm. it's some kind of uh, psychokinetic uh, effect, right? The, the, right? the materialization of 
of a of a of an odor. Uh, and no, I, I what my sense is that the mind itself is uh, is a creative agent, and but we've underestimated the degree of its creativity. Right. And, and um, so mentally, I can form images in my mind, mm -hmm. but there are times when I, well, I can also create images with the help of a paintbrush. Right. But images that have never been seen before. Uh, and then there are some uh, mediums who, some materializing mediums. I was very interested in the 1990s. I was doing research and there was all kinds of reports of the materialization of tears and blood from the paintings and and uh, the statues of, uh, of religious figures. Mm. And, didn't, uh, didn't you see one? You saw one of those miracles. I Talk did. about that. I yeah, did. Tell us, tell us. Uh, I, it, this was in, uh, I think, 1994. And uh, I caught on uh, the news, the story about a, uh, a relic, an icon of St. Irene, an Orthodox Greek saint, uh, weeping in a church in, of all places, Astoria, New York, where I happened to be, have been born. I was born <laughs> in Astoria. So I know how to get there. <laughs> and I was living in Manhattan at the time. Mm -hmm. So I hop on my car and shoot into town. I went actually twice. One time I went with my buddy, who was uh, also my publisher, mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Weege, uh, mm -hmm. science writer. And um, we witnessed, we. I got there early and uh, we, I went right up to this icon and people were online. There were thousands, not, maybe not that much, hundreds, many it, hundreds. It's people. like a golden icon, a classical Greek Orthodox icon. Yes. Yeah. And, and, okay. and, and it was some kind of, a, I forget exactly, uh, I, I should have photographed it. Uh, I didn't yeah. have my smartphone then. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it was, I clearly could see the large, tears coming out of the eyes and moving and the, as the was, eyes the the tears were moving or the eyes were moving the tears tears the okay. tears. yeah i mean they, in other words no the eyes were still and um and of course it's again it, the the to me the, the the notion of the symbol the power of the symbol to tap in to that enables us to tap into these extraordinary powers but uh, I interviewed the, some of the priests there and, and you know, they were telling me that this particular statue had a, or icon had a history and their interpretation was that when it wept, it was a sign of political turmoil and mm. mayhem coming. And often that was true. That's, that was certainly true for quite a number of, of Marian. Marian visions are very politically linked. Mm. Uh, and, uh, Certainly, uh, uh, Fatima was all about politics because uh, it, it, not all about politics, but it was a, a yeah place in a time where the the uh, the Christian faith was being attacked by uh, communists. Yeah. yeah, so it was um, in part these these manifestations are a reaction against the the kind of near death experience of a religion you might right. say did you did you have a feeling a sensation watching the tears or was it just sort of I all that no feeling other than amazement and interest intellectual interest mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a a heartfelt perhaps mm -hmm. if i was a greek uh, believer or something i would have felt it more in my heart it was more my imagination stirred and, and my sense of awe and intellectual um, uh, wonder is what I felt. That's not so bad, right? <laughs> no, no, it's great. Henrietta, what do you make of all this? Because, you, you know, you're a mystic and you're also an intelligent observer of reality. So unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thanks, Michael. How fascinating. The story of the levitating student, the huge man it's uh -huh. amazing um but just thinking uh, everything that you've said and also what i was listening to earlier today 
when you're talking about there seems to this element of there's no rhyme or reason, you know, that these experiences are often very arbitrary as well. well but then, yeah. yeah, but but then um, your story of seeing these lights in Greenwich Village and, and your kind of evocation of, of, you know, drawing this experience, as David mm -hmm. said, to you. Um, I mean, in my experience, when Alan and I, when I was sort of shot into this space of um, remembering UFOs that I'd seen as a child, mm -hmm. um, and, and it, it the same. Oh, I think she froze up, froze up, froze up. Kind of a mystical experience right there when people freeze. Um, come, uh, back. come back, Henrietta, come back. All right. Sometimes her internet. She. Thank you, Roderick. <laughs> um, sometimes. Oh, she's gone. Just yeah. disappearance. That's another miracle. Roderick it, will it, go. It is. It is. In well, India, in well, 19, well, in 19, what was it? Uh, 95. Mm -hmm. That's another one. If you want to talk about it. Oh, we'll it's, talk about that. The Ganesha um, one, right? The Ganesh with the drinking yeah. the milk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mine well, let me get here. Let me just say, get Roderick's comments here. Go ahead, jump in, Roderick. Well, you know, as always, I'm always floored about these conversations. Actually, I'm sitting here taking notes, you know, oh. some of the things that he says. And then with the correlations, you know, you guys was trying to make with UFOs. And uh, <laughs> because oftentimes when I interview a lot of people, it's always about energy and how they felt that this was drawn to them, something or whatever the, the, uh, incident or whatever what they was going through, you know, and so it's kind of uh, amazing when he was talking about how he felt, you know, that the whole thing was intentional, you know, intentional yeah. or whatever. So, um, you know, as I explore down this rabbit hole, I called it myself, you know, it <laughs> just goes deeper and deeper and then it turns to the left, it turns yeah. to the right. And and the night that I'm trying to run back up out of the hole, you just don't know where you go, right? <laughs> There's nowhere to go, Roger. Once yeah. you're down the hole, you're down the hole. Yeah, you're down the hole. So it's <laughs> like, so I'm just amazed and, and, and just growing in knowledge and consciousness of, of all the possibilities that's out there. And, mm -hmm. and once again, he's just put another dynamic, you know, <laughs> on it all. So well, thank you for that intelligent comment. Okay, Henrietta, you're back. You were in the middle when you just froze in space and time. What were you saying? I know, got knocked off at this perfect moment. Well, right. no, I, I, um, Michael was, you spoke a lot in your, in this interview, I was listening to you earlier today about this um, dialoguing with these other realities and, mm -hmm. and the experience you described was exactly that, you know, where this, you're sort of almost like, he's dancing with you, the lights are dancing with you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they go off and then there are these other witnesses. Well, I, my strange experiences that are unexplainable, et cetera, there seems to be a correlation between um, when, when I was very open, um, opened by Alan into this whole new universe, mm -hmm. you know, then I saw a strange light sort of hanging in the corner of my room in New York um, I had dreams that were unlike any other dreams I'd had before it, that, that felt kind of like memories. It was very difficult to discern whether it was a memory of something that actually happened or it was a fantasy that my subconscious was producing. But, but I'm interested in, in how um, there is that relationship that, as Whitley says, you know, I like the title of his book, Communion, because mm -hmm. it, there is a drawing. I, I think even just the the openness to these experiences creates, can create, I don't know if they always do, sort of synchronicities, symbols, happenings, um, just by the very nature of even listening to someone like yourself talk about levitation, actually. Mm -hmm. It's made me think like, you know, our minds are um, extraordinarily incredible and, and we really don't know that. <laughs> yet <laughs> quite or we don't right. understand that and Alan said the other day on an interview I was watching with Whitley Strieber he said um Alan you said well I don't I don't think the UF, UFO phenomenon is a case of of believing in it it's 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 a case of just being open to continually discovering mm -hmm. you know the next that's what thing. came to me 
And if yeah. people say, do you believe in you? It's not about yeah. belief. Right. Like right. as Roderick knows, there's evidence. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, but so, but it's, yeah. uh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. You know, someone like yourself that's done so much research into, you know, ancient um, experiences, uh, you know, and your books on St. Joseph, but also just more recent experiences. And um, I find it just very exciting that we're in communion with a lot of different kinds of um, intelligences. And that was very interesting about Socrates too in his eccentric diamond, <laughs> you know, because it seems to be different for everybody. You'd mentioned that in your um, interview I was listening to earlier that, you know, there's really no rhyme or reason you'd said. It's different for everyone, but it's important to be able to kind of, to really think about what is actually happening, you know, yeah. what you're in communion with. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think it's important to talk about it and say, you know, that's impossible. If we say something's impossible, we shut up a whole part of the universe. So, Michael, you are bringing out possibilities for all of us, including Roderick. Of what is what's the next level? What, what do you how do you put this together, Michael, in a kind of understanding? You know, I, I, I'm one of the things I've been doing during this last year of enforced solitude. Uh, I have an, an extraordinary library. And in addition, uh, the internet has made it very easy to get books that formerly were uh, inex inaccessible and rare. Mm -hmm. So I've taken, I've spent a lot of my time, I've done a lot of things in, the, uh, in this uh, sequestered year, as it were, but I really am studying the history of this, of the subject of the paranormal. And one of the things that it seems obvious to me is that from the beginning, from the beginning of human history, it's all over the place. Mm. And if you really, if you, even if you start reading, I, I've discovered so many extraordinary books and thank goodness for this internet. I mean, it's got some problems, the whole technology uh, issue there, that's another mm. story. But uh, as far as gaining access to information and history and books, I've been able to get all kinds of uh, documents and the picture is gets bigger and bigger in terms of the history of, uh, of the extraordinary. At the same time, there's a constant element throughout from mm -hmm. the early Greek days or even earlier than that, right up until present time, that there's a, a body of individuals who are often highly intelligent, who resist. And I'm getting, I find myself increasingly fascinated by the, fight, the psychology of certain folks that I that I actually like, people that I know well, and I force them to discuss stuff that I know drives them up the wall. <laughs> because I want to understand, I want to understand why someone would get turned off at the hint that their members of their family survived death. Mm. You would think that any evidence for life after death, which is a topic I'm interested in, I've been attacked by a ghost, so I know something about it. Physically attacked, and uh, actually twice. But uh, but what baffles me is the lack of interest in 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 the, in the wideness of life, the potentialities for more life. Yes. Not only for more life, for different forms of life. I, it, people, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I have some very good friends that, that do anything mm -hmm. for me. I have a sister whom I love and adore and is super smart, but she backs away even when I talk about our own mom surviving death. That mm -hmm. really freaks, that doesn't freak me out. That, that's over uh, right. phrasing it, but it shocks me and I find that do you guys have any uh, understanding of why people oh, so, want to be I that think people that people good? get so locked into how reality is that and they're so linear and and rational if you throw something at them that's outside their field they, they there's no place to put it that's what we're having with the UFO situation yeah. where you get scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson great guy very smart saying 
right. Oh, how do you know they're from another planet? How do you know they're really UFOs? How do you know it's not the government? And this is, he's not even looking at the, right. the situation. Right. He's just guessing that it had, it couldn't be that. It right. couldn't be what everyone's saying because it's not in his reality. Um, hey, Michael Rosshart, you have anything to add to that? You can unmute yourself. Unmute. Just, um, yes, hi. Okay. I don't. Um, I mean, in, in terms of what Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, mm. like, I, I think that the thought that, uh, that, you know, such vastness of race, you know, different races of reality, uh, of beings, different vehicles that they have, different reasons and purposes for being mm -hmm. here, that's way too much for someone like him. Right. Um, <laughs> my, 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 uh, my, my father is an engineer and a physicist and he loves looking at uh, the stars. He loves looking at you know, astronomy, but uh, we cannot talk about alien UFO stuff because it just goes, it's, it's too much for him. It's too right. much. And uh, it, so it's, it, I mean, you know, that's just. And here's like, this is what Michael's saying. These are intelligent people. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I, I don't know. I've always been fast. I can't understand closed mindedness personally. So um Dave, well, uh, Henry, oh, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. I'm go, sorry. Go, I mean no, go ahead, know. Michael. Go ahead, and then I'll call on. Yeah, go ahead. In matters that are of a positive nature. I mean, mm -hmm. if someone told you, hey, there's a guy that uh, can do amazing healings, the first instinct should be, yeah, let's see if it's real, because right. that helps. That's a good thing. Right, but right, the right. idea that a miraculous or inexplicable healing, that freaks a lot of people out. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's this fear of, uh, I don't know what the fear is because I don't feel it. It's fear of the unknown. And um, yeah, Ro Roderick, what, are you, what were you going to say, Roderick, about? Well, I was going to just mention, just like with it just kind of uh, camel toe, and that's a new word we're using, on to what, uh, still a piggyback, <laughs> on, you know, as far as relationships and, and people believing, like you were saying, his sister and, you know, even in my house, you know, I'm, I'm recently divorced now or it's going on a year over, but I couldn't talk about UFOs. I couldn't talk about, I couldn't even watch ancient aliens or <laughs> none of that stuff, you know? And then when I stayed up at night to watch it, then I was always accused of, you know, not caring to come to bed early. Right. And, mm. it, and, and it really played havoc in my relationship to a point, my very first uh, MUFON meeting before I became a MUFON and I was so interested and I was like, Hey, I'm going to go. We had one car at the time. And she literally did not come home so that I wouldn't go to inquire about becoming a UFO investigator. And I almost been the good husband was like, mm. you know what, if this is, is bothering my wife or she just can't handle it. Mm. Let me put this subject matter down. But no. now we divorced. This is less than a year later. And when I got on Clubhouse, you know, I was like, maybe I can just find 20 people to talk to, just somebody, nice. you know, and that's 12,000 and I do weekly shows and then there's other things that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm it's just a good saying, thing you got that divorce, Roderick, I'll tell so, you. That. <laughs> so what I'm saying to, to you, you know, uh, Michael, it's yeah. it's important that you still continue on sharing, doing what you do, because it's bigger than those people. They yes. may be our sister, and they may have been my wife. Yeah, yeah. But now I see it's so impact. It's this huge. She would have damaged a whole lot of the future. And the people just that, that. Yeah. And, and just look at the people. Yeah. I'm just adding to that. The people you have influenced because you did go for your passion, the 12,000 people that you've opened up and given them new knowledge. That's something of a soul destiny, I feel. Yeah, and, you know? and I wouldn't even be here with you guys today mm -hmm. and met Alan and, and just so many tremendous uh, new relationships. Now, I'm not saying, and then I'll get back. I know you the headliner here. And, That's okay. No, it's okay. I, I'm not saying that the next person I meet have to do this, but I'm now developing this new conscious thought. Actually, I have a new phrase that I even use when I'm talking to people and, and it goes something like this. I believe you believe, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and what, I'm, what I do now is when somebody shares their story with me and, and most all of us are looking for people to resonate with us and mm -hmm. understand it, it's a lot easier for me to say to you, I believe you believe what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and because what that does is it still allows me to support you, 
without me looking at you and then you try to see if I'm lying to say, I believe you, mm -hmm. this is, you know, but I believe you believe what you're saying, right? And that's how I can support you. That's how I support the people that tell me their stories. And the same thing now, if I'm ever married again, whatever she's interested in, as long as she doesn't say, I have to do exactly the same thing. And I don't want somebody to have to come to all of my well, UFO meetings. Just believe that I believe what I'm doing is good. Well, there's a lot of great women in the UFO field. So uh, you're OK, Roderick. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm Captain Kirk now. I may meet somebody green and up on a starship <laughs> and another planet. You know, you know, how he, I watched Star Trek when I was young. He right, he was right. a great lover of, of the universe, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Henrietta, you were going to say something. Thank you, Roderick. You know, God, I've just forgotten what I was going to say. Oh, OK, um, because I, let, I, let me just let me just okay oh, you I think about it. it i'll just no, go you know, back I, i've got it go i've got it okay, no, okay when when um michael was saying you know that you're um you know you can't believe the lack of interest you know amongst these uh really good friends dear friends I, i've had the same experience i come from such a kind of rational you know english family where all talk of anything um sort of metaphysical was just not on the table but um What's interesting is that, and, and psychics, and, and I have a lot of friends who are psychics and intuitives, uh, Michael Rosehart being one of them. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that these, these friends who don't want to look at that and they don't want to know that part of you, as soon as they're in a crisis or they have an experience that they um, can't explain, then, you know, they call you immediately and they're, they're, they're immediately sort of... <laughs> They're, they're rocketed out of that. It can in a nanosecond. Yes. So it takes it takes a crisis or a strange experience, and then they're calling me and they're saying, "Can I talk to that psychic friend that you've <laughs> been talking about for ten years?" And I don't believe in it. So you know, it's it's interesting. That, it's that, just, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. But but you know, Michael, as a philosopher, because you you taught philosophy and as an intellectual, because you, you take a very intellectual approach, our job as human beings is, start, is to start to make sense of the mystery. How have you made sense outside the linear mechanistic model, of course, but how did you, well, how do you explain this on this, uh, a non-rational level? Well, I don't know what explain means. The, right. okay. The explain is a, is a uh, is a tricky concept. Right, uh, right. I'm more inter I, I think that thing that when you get into something deeply, it's self-explanatory. It reaches a point where you simply know what it is. Uh, I, but uh, that's not the, the complete answer. But yes, there's no question. Uh, in my judgment, where I'm going in terms of my understanding to answer mm -hmm. your question, yeah. is again and again, I find reason to believe in the almost unlimited power and admittedly profound mystery of the nature of mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, where I am gradually making some progress, because I started out with a sort of narrow conception of mind, just my own little personal mind, which was marvelous enough, but it was small, you know, it was just my mind. And gradually over the years, I've come to see that our, our minds are deeply connected at deeper levels. And now I, I believe, uh, along with Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, who was a great uh, student of the Upanishads, uh, who argues very brilliantly for the reality of one mind. And Plato too, essentially said uh, that the nature of, of mind is one. I mean, it, it, mind, you can't, Material, the material world, you can break it up into fragments. You cannot break up your mind. Uh, it, it is one. And uh, things are related in, the, in our mental life in ways that are entirely different the way they are related in the physical world. And mm -hmm. so that's a, a fundamental distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you admit the reality of mind, and a lot of scientists and physicalists are uh, unwilling to do that. They want to keep things simple and explain everything physically. But once you admit the reality of a larger expanded mind, 
and just sort of read off the properties, the effects, the psychokinetic effects, the independence of time and space. Mm -hmm. um, you gradually get a sense of uh, the mind as being the ultimate explanatory principle. And mm -hmm. then the real interesting challenge is, is to see how that works out in detail mm -hmm. so that you get more confidence uh, based on a lot of different kinds of experiences and realities that it just begins to come together. It's like uh, making a painting. You start off chaotically and then the more you work on it, you try different things and it suddenly starts to come together. And uh, will it stay? Will our understanding remain constant? I have the feeling that the nature of our mental life is such that we'll never be satisfied. We're always mm -hmm. gonna find new levels of meaning, new dimensions. And so it's kind of unwise, I think, not to be comfortable with uncertainty even as you are evolving. Right. If you're not comfortable with uncertainty, uh, you're not comfortable with novelty. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's, I'm prepared to admit, I'll always be partially in the dark, but I do <laughs> bit by bit, I'm getting a clearer picture and maybe I can share this with others. Well, and that, that's no, my overall view. No, that's great. I think David, you're kind of looking into a similar kind of area. Can you talk about your work in that area? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I think it's uh, what I'm interested in, uh, not as well, I guess it would be in, into what I'm looking at, but it's so I've been watch, watching a lot of um, Alan's conversations with folks doing channeling in that. Um, and he had a, I don't know if this is a recent one with Daryl Anka, who's in Making Contact. Yeah, th and, that's recent. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I don't know if it was the, there was one that you have up that's like the uh, multidimensional full interview where you're interviewing. Oh, Bish no, that, that was a couple of years old, right? Yeah. Bish yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this, this idea of the one mind filters through all of that, you know, and through, uh, through a lot of what, what comes through in a lot of the, the channeled material as well. And I think it's an interesting way to look at that because you have these, um, what people are experiencing or may actually be other consciousness coming through saying that there's one, you know, and, and performing in different ways. And then, um, you know, like you said, I mean, the synchronicities, right? Like this, this idea that what we're experiencing in the world where these synchronicities that happen in our life are almost like another consciousness coming in, you know, mm -hmm. and these different ways to have these different experiences, which, if you see that concept of one mind and you start to think of it like, like that, like you just pointed out, Michael, I think that really does become an amazing um, lens to start to, to look at that and experiment with it and see that kind of, that experience. I mean, that's uh, Valet with the, um, the cultural theory of UFOs and that control system, mm -hmm. you know, and how the wider experience of the UFO event, right? I mean, a lot of, when you look at it in the media, it's this idea of you see a UFO and that's it. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a ship and there's a thing there. But in reality, what happens is, is it's, you experience a phenomenal kind of shift. You know, it's a shift in thinking. It's a, there's a, a feeling in the air. There's a feeling of that moment. There's a feeling beforehand, mm -hmm. you know, um, most UFO investigators find that there's, you know, psychic after effects where yeah. suddenly the person who has a really strong encounter will have psychokinesis happen afterwards, or they'll have, you know, they'll start to have telepathic, mm -hmm. um, you know, or clairvoyant um, or precognitive events start to happen, you know? Um, and so this, this view of the, of a wider sense of mind, you know, expanding out to the possibility of one mind, Mm -hmm. You know, I think really does become a powerful tool to start to, to, ex to experience these things. And it, and it, like you said, that it doesn't really end there, right? Like that's not something that you just suddenly, oh, there's one mind and we're done. Mm -hmm. Because the, the amazing ways that that kind of, un, you know, it unfolds through life, you know, it has all these different aspects on it. And the farther out you go, you know, and it even goes down to, a, you know, if you want to look at it materially, the fact that the way that um, 
you know, the universe expands. If you go and look at photos of space, they often, you know, the way it expands looks like uh, either roots or branches or some of it looks like neurons, mm. right? Like it, it actually physically looks like the, you know, the physical transceiver that we have in our head, you know? So if there's, so maybe that's true. There's only one mind here and um, we're all aspects of that. And um, we're evolving back towards that awareness uh, and UFOs are here to wake us up to that as well. Um, it yeah, seems like- I, I, I think so. And I wanna just make one point about, yeah. a practical point about the one mind. Yeah. It, it, that it, it's, it, the more we experience the oneness of mind, the more, and the more we are telepathic that's a nice Greek word invented by Myers, meaning feeling at a distance, mm -hmm. the more empathy we have. And so let's face it, we could use a little empathy on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that a, a, a one mind, a, an expanded concept of mind, uh, it, it should enable us, practically speaking, to be more sensitive to other human beings and to other living creatures and even non-living creatures. Mm -hmm. I, I've increasingly, tending toward, well, you know, the different ways of describing one's worldview, I'm finding myself drifting backwards toward indigenous ideas of animism. And uh, I, to me, when I'm happiest, most alert, most alive, I'm an animist, everything is alive. And, uh, mm -hmm. and if everything is alive, it's sort of an extension of myself, a part of myself, and I'm not, I'm going to be a little more sympathetic and friendly uh, toward the world around me it, it, with that animated sense of the oneness of mind and spirit. And so that's what I think the great sort of philosophical and evolutionary drift of all of this might be. Mm. Uh, variety, indeed, and novelty, indeed, but a oneness and empathy at the same time so as to make life more beautiful and less, mm -hmm. less suffering. And, yeah, and, uh, I, yeah, I agree. I think when we're like that, circumstances also change for us, you know? Mm -hmm. As, and, and, you know, just like Roderick, Roderick said, he had to kind of let go of what was stopping that from happening. And when he did, this incredible world opened up because he expanded, it seemed, I don't, into the larger reality. And, um, and and uh, my question, though, to you, Michael, is, is it do you think the world will ever get to the equilibrium where everyone has that sensibility or, uh, you know, will we graduate to, a, um, you know, a utopia in a sense? Or is that just idealism? Well, it, it's idealism in a way. But it, one of the things I'm working on now, uh, and I've written a couple of pieces to this effect, not yet a book, but gradually I've come to see all of the bits and pieces of extraordinary human behavior. And I try to piece them together and um, as expressions of a single human being. Mm. And, and that becomes my model of where we may be evolving toward. I mean, I have, I don't think it's a strange thing to say that human beings are highly evolved, but not in a coherently reliable way. There wouldn't be so much suffering in the world if we were all equally sensitive or roughly, we don't have to be identical and robotically the same, but with an underlying sense of, of human commonality, of common, common sensibility common sense as well, uh, and commerce, common super sensibility. But I think that, um, uh, that that's what all this is pointing toward. I mean, I guess my point was that I, I see all of these extraordinary phenomena as pointing toward a possible evolution of the species as a whole. The, the data indicates it's real and it's possible. If one man can levitate, there's no reason why we can't. If one saint can radiate these magnificent uh, 
odors for what reason, who knows exactly how it works, we can all do it. And uh, so that's how I like to think of, uh, of these phenomena as pointers toward our possible evolution. I even have a model for how it could happen. And Tell us, yeah. The, well, the yeah. model is simply based on the near-death experience. An ordinary everyday person can have a near-death experience and be almost instantly transformed uh, and, and have a different view, uh, have different values, uh, a, a different form of consciousness, different behavior. We all know this if we've read into the literature of the near-death experience. Well, one of the ideas that's been uh, floating through my head, especially lately, uh, with the confrontation of this uh, climate challenge that we're facing, as well, of course, uh, the, the, the current uh, 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 disease, the global pandemic and all of that, I, I, I have this um, thought that we may be heading toward a kind of global near-death experience, mm. which uh, so large, vast numbers of people are going to be confronting uh, such dramatic circumstances that there will may very well be sort of massive, collective, contagious uh, uh, explosions of higher consciousness that might very well lead to an entirely new civilization. It may be a costly, painful, and disastrous for many process, but, uh, and I'm not hoping this is gonna happen, but I, I have a feeling that uh, that might be a model of the future of our species that we've, I mean, after all, with all the science that we've evolved, we've developed scientific methods to wreak havoc on ourselves and the planet. That has to stop or else we, we, don't, we don't survive as a species. Well, so I think this is what the UFO experience is not exact as it's maybe as dramatic as a near death, but suddenly your your world is ripped apart. Uh, Roderick right. just just had a guest on his show, this woman, Anjali, who might be on here next week, um, who got these messages. Roderick, do you want to tell people what this uh, contactee said about these beings that have warned us? Um, can you? Well, um, I don't want to not put the message out the right way, you know. Okay. Uh, well, but regardless, I mean, she did have a message, and and the message was, you know, there's going to be a shift, and there's things that uh, some will and some won't make, mm -hmm. you know, go through what what we're going through, and or um, transcending, or yeah, and so yeah, she calls it transcending. We need to yeah. trans. Each one of us need to transcend. But I did that particular uh, interview. You know, you know, it's up on YouTube mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. people are now listening. So if you, right. whenever you're done watching this, you can go to extraterrestrial evidence, uh, the mm -hmm. YouTube channel, uh, and if, you know, just Google, I mean, type in that name, my name or whatever, both. And then there, the whole interview is there. She does deliver the message. And I think it's not, nothing better said than hearing it from that person who experienced, because you can feel the emotion, you can feel the, uh, mm -hmm just really um, the internal thing, you know, cause you, what you guys were just talking about earlier. So I think that uh, it's a powerful message, but it's also, you can see the, the stress, not so much of the stress, but the, the psychological factor that it places on her, you know, just being the person to try to put that message out, the pressure, the, mm -hmm. you know, and it takes a lot of courage for you, uh, as, you know, Michael is what you're doing and as well as her and anybody that mm -hmm. is coming forth in the time as we are today to try to tell us how, you know, the message that they're receiving and, and like y'all were saying earlier, you know, David and, and everyone else, might, you know, how people not believing in this or, mm -hmm. you know, not understanding. And, and so, yeah, with you, you have ufology, it starts from the top and it's comes down to the bottom. So I think it's, uh, you know, and I'll close out with this to saying that I think we, as far as you, UFO investigators, we spend a lot of time focusing on what's in the sky, you know, and I think it's mm -hmm. time for our, a lot of people to focus what's happening with the people on the ground. Right. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. where the shift is headed. 
Hmm. And and this woman, I hope to get her on the show next week or in the next few weeks. She... Yeah, yeah. Next week, I think she told me that she's, okay. she's available for you. So we'll, um, you know, you and I put that together for you. So. Right. I mean, she's raw. She had not quite a near-death experience, but she had this mm, illness that kind of opened her mind. She started to see these ETs just appear and more and more and she's got a message from these uh, beings to tell people it is time for us to transcend wake up however you're put we're putting it it's like what you said um michael it's time it's time to become um unaware of the oneness of consciousness is really what i think it comes down to but and you know, one thing I want to yeah. uh, add to to what Michael was saying um, with this idea of contagion, because mm -hmm. one of the things I've really been fascinated with um, in terms of uh, psychic phenomena and parapsychological research is the concept of contagion when it comes to experiencers who are at a certain level. Um, what, what, what does that mean, contagion? What is that? How do you define well, that? Well, so, uh, you know, uh, a disease is contagious, right? So oh, okay. it's, it's transmittable. Okay. And one of the interesting things that happens in some situations, um, like, for instance, with uh, psychokinesis, is if you get a strong psychokinetic experiencer into a situation and, they, and the phenomena starts happening, other people who are in that experience, in that situation, will start to exhibit it as well. And so, you know, people may know about the spoon bending parties, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone can demonstrate spoon bending, suddenly everybody in the room starts to demonstrate spoon bending or a right. good percentage of them will. And so that's a really interesting idea, Michael, with this, you know, because it would be a cascade effect. Yeah. If you started to have, you know, people to have these kind of transcendent uh, movement and on a mass level, especially with, um, you know, the internet and with this interconnectivity and this hyperconnectivity, there would be an interesting kind of cascade to that. You know, I know there was a uh, Christopher Altman is a, a citizen astronaut um, right. who uh, he I forget what project he worked with, but he had worked with some uh some of the aerospace stuff that that happened a while ago and he's now he's very interested in ufos and that but he had a, a really interesting keynote speech that he gave where he talked about edgar mitchell's overview effect mm -hmm. and so when you know edgar mitchell famously goes up into space and when he when well, most a lot of the astronauts had this experience when they look back down on earth mm -hmm. suddenly their view shifted and it was like whoa like we're not you know we're not americans and we're not even you know i mean this is this is this it's, it's, it's a totally different experience and so what uh, Christopher Altman pointed out was what's going to happen when more and more people start going into space and we get and it's hyper connected in the way that we're hyper connected mm, now yeah it'll be a mass overview effect where we're all you know in a way we're all kind of going up into space and that and it's it'll mm. be a totally and so combine that with this this concept of you know the the climate changes that are happening and the the kind of collective trauma you know or the collective trauma with the the kind of social shifts that we're seeing mm -hmm. you know so that's a, just to to kind of add to what you were saying michael i think that's a really it's a, a fruitful and kind of interesting uh path to go down and think about because i really do think you're right i think we're going to see more and more of that you know and then you know on the on the kind of psychic end of things, there is evidence for this kind of uh, contagiousness. And there's, a, you know, people can look up the Geller effect as well. When Yuri right. Geller went on television, yeah. suddenly there were kids that started doing spoon right. bending. Right, you know? right, yeah. Uh, no, uh, I remember uh, having a, a, a student who could uh, read object, he would touch an object he can talk about, who owned it, the story. And he says, I can, if you hang out with me, you can do it too. And he was right. Right, right. Uh, I, he would hand me something confidently, and suddenly I started rattling off associations that were accurate. Right. And the other thing I would just like to mention, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Batchelor, Kenneth Batchelor. No. English. English uh, well, he, he has written, I happen to have a whole bunch of his unpublished papers, and he is the master of the group dynamics of the paranormal mm -hmm. and he you know uh, did all kinds of fascinating ex experiments and his basic thing what he was able to do 
was to take a group of people who had no known interest in or psychic ability. And after getting together as a group, he, in a fairly short time, he was able to teach or enable his group to levitate a table without contact, not mm -hmm. just touching it and having it move. We know all of that for, for the, for the we, Ouija board, right? You right. touch it and it kind of moves. But what about not touching it and moving it? And but what was required was the group mentality because the individual couldn't imagine himself or herself doing it and, and didn't want to even be responsible. It's a freakish thought to know that you can make things like that happen. So if you're with a group and, you, and no one has the responsibility, the specific responsibility, it's e apparently the process is easier. But anyway, his writings are quite fascinating and bear on this theme that we're discussing of contagion uh, and, and how these processes and how this greater consciousness might very well uh, uh, explode in unexpected and extraordinary ways, uh, especially as you point out with new, the new technology that we have that we can connect like this. Well, that's interesting. You're saying one person couldn't believe that they could do it by themselves, but the group had uh, the, the insurance of other people to feel like they could do it. That's, that's really interesting. There, uh, there's another example of that too, Alan, um, the Philip experiment. Oh, and, uh, I'm sure you know, Michael knows about that, right? Go ahead, yeah. talk about that, David. Talk about the Philip experiment, because I, well, I, I, I have some questions about that, but tell us what that is. Well, it's a similar, it's a similar case of displacement of, um, of the phenomena where, you know, they, the, what it was, was this, it was, uh, they basically invented a poltergeist, mm -hmm. you know, they, they got together and they, uh, they wrote up a story about Philip and they created a background and a history. And then they did seances to bring Philip about mm -hmm. and Philip showed up, <laughs> Philip showed up and responded based on the, the autobiography, you know, the, the biography they'd written for him and mm -hmm. responded by by levitating tables and that kind of thing but it took the group mm -hmm. to meet regularly and to have a, a regular sitting group uh, and seance group mm -hmm. but what was interesting was it demonstrated uh you know michael like what you were saying this kind of displacement of of guilt almost you know like the, i they didn't have to to see that they were the ones doing it you know it was philip mm -hmm. doing it well but, it just, but that's my was, that's my argument with the philip experiment is like maybe they were telepathically unconsciously getting philip from the ethers right. to come through. Uh huh. I never thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah. What, what did you? So there's uh, Michael Rosehart. You have a comment about all this that you're hearing. I was I was just going to comment that um that's uh, a similar type of situation happened with the end of the Montauk uh, project where um, Preston Nichols joined with um, um Duncan. The, the, yeah, Duncan, and and they created that dark being to destroy the the project. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Montauk stuff, uh, but yeah, <laughs> I've heard that one too. Is like a little suspicious, but but Michael uh, Grosso, you just wrote a book of uh, what's the latest about Smile? Um, Smile of the Universe. Uh, talk miracles, about that. Miracles in an age of disbelief. Smile comes from the uh, the. Uh, the Sanskrit root of the word miracle is smai. Oh. So I thought that's cool, that the, the, the smile is, is the smile of, of, uh, of wonder and awe. Uh, so that was kind of a rhetorical word that I used. <laughs> and I think it turns off some people because it makes them think of religion, uh, right. but it doesn't for me. I just think of the poetry of it. And the, and the criterion uh, that I used in this study, again, uh, picking on the most dramatic and shocking types of phenomena, as long as there's good data for them. And uh, basically um, uh, attempted to, um, first of all, argue that there's evidence for these things that we call miracles. Uh, I talked about the different, the, the breakdown, the parapsychological breakdown of the, the types of phenomena. And again, I try to invest all of these 
powers that are implied by these phenomena in the concept of a, of a new human being. And uh, one of the ideas of the, the book that uh, is less noticed that I'd like to call attention to is that uh, I, I try to show to people who have no religious faith, uh, no attachment to any religion whatsoever, that there are empirical facts that enable us to imagine how it is possible for each of us to communicate with a greater mind. And in a way, you see, uh, that experiment that you were just talking about, uh, David, uh, is also could also be viewed as a sort of a model of how we come to believe in God. Uh, because lots and lots of people believe in various gods, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it does appear that these uh, contexts and groups of people and their religious beliefs often produce effects. So I'm wondering, you see, if that's what's, uh, what's going on, that we're, we're in a sense being given enough information to flesh out and endow the, uh, and re-endow as it were with reality, the idea of a higher being, a greater mind, a divine reality, whatever terminology you like, but it has to come out of the belief systems of human beings. I'm not sure if there's anything out there apart from us, uh, mm -hmm. other than the great mind, which has a life of its own. But I do think that uh, the stuff that we're studying right now, the, the ufology and the parapsychology, is a kind of modernistic, analytic, experiential rediscovery of the divine. In, a, yeah. in an age of disbelief. That's the gist of my book. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I, I argue that for atheists, uh, disbelievers, uh, uh, it, it's still open mm -hmm. to engage what? in a dialogue with what may very well be uh, a, a, an existing uh, great mind and i'm sure you know that uh, that there is based on the data that i've uh, looked at and the history of, of this uh, of human experience well i i think instead of also taking it out towards a god the other aspect of the miracle is who we are we are walking around in these bodies these pieces of meat this piece of earth that we're animating that mm -hmm. with some unknown force that that's yeah. as amazing as any any of the miracles that you've even witnessed how does that levitate that's as amazing as levitation right henry yes i agree I, that, that my other way of looking at the phenomena is that they are reflections of our own individual mm -hmm. uh selves and our potential higher selves mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely. And it's both inner and outer uh, within us. And it's the world, too, that, that we want to see come to life, animated and full of uh, this uh, reality. Yeah. You, you know, Henrietta does have an interesting story because when she finally and I, I'm just uh, she says this in her essay in the book, but when she finally opened up to the possibility of UFOs, I won't tell the whole story for you, Henrietta. But some other aspect of being opened up. Can can you relay that, Henrietta? When you, that that situation, if I told it right. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm just. It, it really yeah. kind of segues into what um, Michael and David were talking about with this um, this massive collective contagious mm -hmm. <laughs> um, shift that they feel. I mean, I'm we all feel it right i mean and so that was that's just my particular part of it i mean I, it's it seems like there's this huge pressure or force of evolution to become something you know the the, the new human being that michael speaks about i mean that's that's my that's just my feeling i mm. i couldn't say that i know it but my own little personal segment of it is yes as soon as i'd was rocketed into <laughs> sort of the, the dreams of the UFOs and the beings and the, the abductions and the communications, my whole uh, reality changed my whole relationships to everybody, everything, to nature, you know, and it's definitely, I can only describe it as, you know, being in 
a state of joy and wonder and awe and excitement and productivity, mm. you know, and, and put that in, in a group. If everybody's got that kind of excitement and energy, then who knows what can happen? <laughs> you know, that, mm. that's my take on it. I mean, yeah. all my personal neuroses and they, they really did sort of change. You know, mm. like things things fell away that weren't useful, mm. um, which was just kind of an interesting um, mm. side product of these experiences that happened very fast. Yep. You know. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, so Michael, what do we do with all this? You know, miracles have been happening, and I do believe they do happen for for eons and. People like stare at it and wonder, oh, that's nice. And then they go on with their very sort of mundane life. Is, yeah. is there this global shift possibly? Or are we probably maybe just going to continue? Oh, yeah, there was a miracle there. Like I was in India um, and there was this large statue of a cow that just seemed to be out of place. And I said, what is it with the statue? It seems to be like you know, moving or kind of tuned that too close to this column. And the priests in the temple said, well, that statue grows every year. And um, I said, okay. So I, but I'm just saying, so this goes on. This is, has been going on. There's, there's some special people that appear in our midst, like a Yuri Geller or a, a, Joseph, a St. Joseph or, but, are we ever going to grow up and, and embrace it? Or is this just the ongoing drama of humanity, like with its head in the sand? That's, that's the big question. Oh, go ahead, Henrietta, for, and then Michael, go ahead. Yeah, well, no, I just wanted to say on the back of you saying that, Alan, as Michael already said, that he felt like he, this model that he has of the, the global near-death experience, right. these dramatic right. circumstances, that's, it's kind of like, it's not really a choice. It's just we all you know, we're, we're pushed there. I, I mean, because of all these, um, a, a whole selection of circumstances happening very quickly. I mean, oh, is, over is, to Michael. I, but I find, yeah. yeah. But is there a global awakening that you're seeing, Michael? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, glimmers of it, but my view is a little bit on the grim side, uh, I, I I'm sure you guys are aware of, of uh, the uh, climate issues and all of that. Mm -hmm. But from, as far as I can make out, uh, the, the things are gonna get worse for the world at large. I don't see, I mean, even though th th there's a lot of hope and there are good things happening, I'm not denying that. But I, I, I feel that to answer your question, it, we, we absolutely need to evolve to that more complete person, that, mm -hmm. more, uh, that future human that I, I'm imagining, that we can all easily imagine by just thinking about it. Because if we don't, in a significant way, mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, we're gonna suffer a lot. And, uh, and if not, uh, you know, we hear a lot of talk about the end, the destruction of world civilization coming. I take well, all of that quite seriously because I'm mm -hmm. a compulsive reader. I read everything and uh, it, it, the picture does not look good at all. And it's easy to forget about it if you don't, you don't want to think about mm -hmm. it. But so my sense is that transformation of humanity uh, is um, absolutely necessary to survive as a species. Uh, this is, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just saying this is the message of Roderick's guest and uh, Angela and Jolly in a sense where she's saying we have to transcend if, if we're going to go to the next level. I, I not to butcher the message, but I think it's something like that. Right, Roderick? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I don't pretend that I'm the only one thinking in those terms. No, no. But, uh, this is where, where I'm moving and I keep want, wanting to... Uh, and sometimes uh, I get with people, they don't want to hear the negative side of, of things. But uh, well, if your house is on fire, don't you want someone to tell you that? Right. It's not <laughs> right. negative. <laughs> right. Exactly. So but, uh, again, using the model of the near death experience yeah. uh, is, I mean, the worst possible thing that can happen to you often results in the greatest experience of your life. 
Now that's mm. an interesting paradox. And uh, so, so we should be optimistic about our pessimism. <laughs> Maybe that's the, maybe human, maybe we have to get down to the lowest level. Maybe we're almost there to, to <laughs> wake up. Like, yeah. So Michael uh, Rothart, I'm sure you have something to comment about that, right? Um, about the fact that, you know, evolving oneself to a higher level, because... I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it. I, I I think we are absolutely on that trajectory, and to yeah. kind of extrapolate back into what David was talking about with how certain UFO experiences can kind of uh, elicit uh, and enhanced abilities. What I what I from what I understand, what I believe is that uh, a a UFO or alien experience changes someone's frequency, changes their auric field even, right. and so if you know. Um, just appearance. That's why it appear, appearances of ships th that can actually do that as well. So it's mm. it's akin to like what Michael's saying about with the near near death experience. I believe. I mean, one might have more more power than another, or might shift a little more. But um, it's 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 providing that level of change, that level of transformation mm. that's appropriate for that person. I think. Mm. So it's happening, maybe, Michael, maybe the UFO situation, the government coming forward, which is happening. Um, well, there are, yes, the those are a number of, a number of positive things. One, uh, another is uh, the legalization of marijuana. That's what, an what, is that, what does that do? Well, it, it opens up the possibility of more consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the other, another thing that I would stress that I, I constantly point this out, to myself at least, <laughs> is it's only been the past 30 or so years that um, scientists have woken up to something that little babies know, namely that animals are conscious. Uh -huh. I'm very interested in animal consciousness studies nowadays. It's brand new for mm -hmm. decades. And go, going back to Descartes, the philosophers, apparently uh, Descartes never had a cat. Uh, I, I mean, and, and, you know, I had this sort of mechanistic view of what, of all animals, but there's a lot of fascinating work being done about animal consciousness today. That's a big step forward. Uh, so there are signs of, uh, of opening up that the UFOs, uh, since mm -hmm. what was it, 2017, it started, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and, and of course the, this, this, that the political, uh, the issues, the reckoning with uh, racism and, uh, and the, the yeah. and women, consciousness, uh, uh, all of these are very important uh, developments. And uh, so I'm sort of optimistic, uh, even though at the same time, I have a grim view of what may be coming. I'm optimistic too. And that's why I wrote this book, uh, Making Contact. Uh, if you can't see it there, I'll pull it up uh, here. But- you um, can't see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, there. Yep, there yeah, go, Roderick. Roderick, thank <laughs> you. It's always on hand. Thank you so much. Roderick's become a really good friend. I have um, a digital version of it. Okay. Oh, right. You have the digital. I'll get you a hardcover if you want. Um, can you just, because I think what is also optimistic is, can you tell us another miracle story? Because when you hear them and you know that they're true, I think that also, like the UFO, incites possibility. So mm -hmm. I know you have a bunch of, can you tell us, uh, not that you're telling stories, but I think they're, they're activating, you know? Yeah, well, there are so many strange things that <laughs> happen. And what amazes me is how quickly they're forgotten. So mm -hmm. for example, this uh, experience in, I think it's 1995, I'm terrible with numbers, but 1995, there was uh, a one day that uh, I, by accident, caught on the news uh, a report about the disappearance, the dematerialization of milk all over India, and in fact, turned out to be all over the world. Uh, some Indian in the Far East had a dream of Ganesha, and Ganesha said, I'm thirsty, I want some milk. So we rushed to the church or the temple and, uh, and offered some milk, to the to, statue, uh, to the to the statue, right? The statue drank it. It dis disappeared. 
So this thing spread all over India and all over the world where there were Indian uh, uh, temples. I, by chance, turned on the, the uh, I, I had uh, television then, uh, I still have it more or less, but I turned on um, and I saw a BBC reporter on CNN holding a cup of milk in his hand because he was reporting on this event. So the camera goes right down onto the, uh, onto the cup of milk in front of the st statue. And I'm watching it, it disappears slowly, <laughs> right down to the bottom, it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, of course, I start reading about it. And there are thousands of people uh, who are having this experience. It turned out that two of my students who were Indians came into class and uh, at a later date, I, I believe this was, with written accounts of what they experienced. One of my students went online three times to convince himself that it was real. Each time, of course, there was, uh, the, 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 the milk disappeared. Now, where the heck did that milk go? <laughs> I mean, it's mind blowing to think about, there, there was a milk shortage in India on that day. Now, it's also amusing, I call it amusing, of the scientists who try to explain it away by some totally stupid and irrelevant mechanism of, uh, I forgot the terminology he used. The problem was, why did it happen only that one day, according right. to their theory? Uh, it, it, it was, to my mind, one of the most amazing uh, things because dematerialization is a pretty strange phenomenon. By the way, I myself had a dematerialization experience in a haunted house uh, that I visited, and that's where the ghost attacked me, but I won't talk about that. But, what, what, uh, what, de, what dematerialized, though? Can you I talk about that? I'm going to tell you. Oh, okay. To unspook this family, nine people in this family, this was a student, not a great student of mine, a woman, she told me that there was this ghost in the family, uh, that in, in the house, at least nine people witnessed it. It was a very annoying uh, ghost that liked to watch the girls when they were in the bathroom. So I called it a dirty old ghost. <laughs> I recommended that they insult the ghost and tell him to get the frig out mm -hmm. because they won't tolerate his presence. And he just came back and, and kept bugging them. So I thinking, I had a great idea. I, I bought a picture of Padre Peel. Who picture Padre Peel? I said, let's put this picture. This is a holy man. This damn ghost ain't gonna mess with Padre Peel, right? And so we, we, I stuck it, or she, my, my student stuck it in a, uh, uh, a glass, uh, uh, I don't know what you call a bureau or something so that it was visible but closed so that her three kids couldn't even reach up to get it. There's no way that that could be touched. And uh, a couple of days later, she called me up and she says, it's, di it's disappeared, it's dematerialized. And I, we never saw that, pi that, 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 uh, that picture again. Now, when I went back to the house one night and spent the night there, I'll, I'll quickly tell you the story. Uh, I said, all right, I want to meet this entity. So I spent the night and um, it was two o'clock in the morning and I was in a room by myself reading and wide awake. And suddenly I heard a gong ring, the gong in the room. I look up on the wall and there's a gong with a stick in it. I'm sorry, the gong with a drum. Mm. So I go and I pick it up, I have to pull the stick out and I hit it. It's the same sound but nobody could have produced that sound. So I said, oh, very good, the ghost did it. And I felt, mm. yeah, pretty good. The ghost came away after all and gave me a little evidence. And I sat back down. About 10 minutes later, I look up and there's the damn ghost and it's a transparent form. And it's like about 10 feet away from me, okay? And the minute I look at it, it comes right at me and it wraps itself around me and paralyzes me. And I'm like this, and I'm trying to shout to the, all the folks upstairs who were sleeping, it's here. I couldn't open my mouth, I was paralyzed. And in a few seconds, it just released me. And uh, I resumed my writing and thinking, 
on the one hand, I was terrified, but at the other hand, on the other hand, I was absolutely uh, ecstatic about <laughs> being attacked by a ghost. Because like, tell me, ask me if I believe in ghosts. I know that they exist. One of them attacked me. So uh, that was the story of that house. I mean, there was the dematerialization, the ghost attacked me. And I had a wonderful student. She was brilliant, by the way. A brilliant, mm. and turned into a very fine uh, anthropologist. And it was an honor to get to have her as a student. But so, yeah, there, I, I, I've had a lot of strange experiences. And uh, that's what I can't forget. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, did, did the ghost leave the ha did, did the ghost stop doing its um, tricks? In oh, the no, no. Uh, but uh, I kind of lost contact with uh, Elizabeth yeah. was her name. And I, I, it, it didn't, uh, it was not to be, uh, <laughs> mm. yeah, as far it as remained. I remained. Yeah, it's it's stuck. It, it, it's, you, there it's, are ghosts. There are people who work with ghosts and send them to the light. You know, hungry ghosts. Yes. I mean, yeah, awesome. yeah. Well, I, uh, I, yeah, I never did something like that, and and I didn't spend much time in the house. Uh, mm -hmm. So I said, can I spend the night? You know, mm -hmm. then I'll just sleep on a couch and keep my eyes open. I yeah. never thought I would get such a, <laughs> a display. First the gong. I mean, I remember that as clear as if it were one minute ago. I'm in a room, there's nobody there, and there's someone making the sound that you would make if you picked the, the stick off and hit the gun. But, I mean, that's but, impressive. You know, it all comes down, this whole conversation comes down to expanding our worldview about what's possible. I mean, I, I met a ghost once in a haunted house that I actually threw out of the house and... Oh, okay. um, because it was waking me up in the middle of the night. I just remembered like lifting this thing up and putting it outside. I don't know how I did that or why, or, mm -hmm. but it, 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 there's so much more to reality, um, including UFOs, including power, yeah. including levitate. And we are really trapped in this really narrow view, or we have been, and, and this is what we're here to learn and expand into. Um, I think that's, so. and, and, uh, but you know, it, it's been a, a process. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like to buy very old books that tell me the history of a subject. Right. And I have a book that I'm working on now by a guy named uh, uh, Richard Baxter that was published in 1691. And it's basically a study of ghostly phenomena. Mm -hmm. And he is ranting against the people who deny and won't face the evidence that he's collected in the same way that my colleagues here in Charlottesville who do research on near-death experiences and stuff like that, get the same kind of resistance mm -hmm. or the same kind of resistance that I've encountered. Exactly, exactly the same. That's there what I'm saying, does it change? But Henrietta, what were you gonna say? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that when you were all talking about this, um, you know, rather grim situation, like Michael's saying, if you really read a lot about, you know, that it's, it, it looks pretty grim in the physical world, right? Mm, right. E ecologically, um, and for ourselves too, with all these new um, viruses or, you know, you name it, it's out mm. there. But because we've been talking about this group effectiveness, it occurs to me that, you know, um, <laughs> remaining positive, you know, really like, but knowing how grim it looks, but really pushing through with this positivity that we can evolve into something else that we can survive as a species is, is uh, important to have that attitude, yeah. you know, but it doesn't mean to say that you disregard looking at the absolute horrors that occur right. daily. You know, but um, I can agree completely. But yeah. it's hard to, to be to have that. Uh, it is hard. The complex perspective, but the reality yeah. is complex. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Right? But and, uh, mm. if we don't want to confront the challenges uh, and the realities that are negative, you'll never get to the uh, really good stuff. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's the paradox that you were describing. Yeah. 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 So how do we, I'm not saying get people to change, but I guess maybe this thing that you feel is coming, this collective NDE or this, you know, you wake up universal making contact day or um, 
I don't know. Uh, to, to wrap up, uh, we should wrap up soon. Uh, David, you have any ideas about, because um, you're a student of, of phenomena in a way. And um, Well, that was what I, I was really struck by with Mike, Michael said about the collective NDE idea. Because, you know, um, Kenneth Rain, right? He did the, the studies that looked at NDEs and uh, the UFO experience yeah. and showed yeah. how there were some similarities to that, but I think that, you know, how do we get people to do it? Um, yeah, I think that's where the contagion and kind of like a cascade effect strikes me, you know, with this hyper mediation, because um, you'll have people that are drawn to it that want to kind of work with it and kind of understand that and, and look and that you'll have people who get fascinated by it and get kind of enwrapped in it and that, you know, but then there's the contagion effect where suddenly, you know, if if phenomena does increase, whether it's you know UFO phenomena or NDE phenomena or or um, you know psychic phenomena and that what, whatever type of phenomena starts to increase, that's going to just start you know building on top of itself where people will just start having these experiences you know. Um, so and yeah. and I think too with the with the connectivity, you know if you think about how many podcasts there are now. You know, ancient ancient aliens, uh, for for whatever it's worth, is is um, one of the longest running television shows. Right. Right. You know, and so, you know, it's hit or miss in terms of the subject. But you know, they've had like the Rhine Center uh, was on uh, ancient aliens to feature Ed Edwards, who's mm -hmm. actually uh, he lives a little bit north of me here. Right. Um, or know. did I think he's up in I think he's up in New York now. I think. Alan, yeah, you, I know you, Ed very well. Yeah. yeah, you stole him. You stole him from us down here in Georgia. No, <laughs> you stole him away. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, he's a healer, electric healer. Yeah. Yeah. So. And he does and he does a, an almost contagion effect thing, too, because he does his healings over uh, online where he can activate people and, and do that, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. so I think that there's a there's an element to this hyper connectivity. Um, which may, which may aid in that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Michael Razo, you have anything you want to leave us with to add to the conversation? I uh, just in, in question of uh, how long it might take. And that that's, uh, and maybe we can do it again. Oh, wait, uh, wait. I was just asking my, wait one second, Michael Gross. I was just asking Michael Razo if he had a final oh, word. Oh, one one second. Okay. No, no. Okay. Go ahead. My Michael Ratz, Ratz, Ratz heart, Rose heart. I was just saying, in terms of waiting, um, it seemed uh, it, it's it's just that it's it's about waiting. It's about waiting for the the right time. I think for for it to happen. I don't you know. Well, I don't know if it's about waiting. I think we have to take action. Myself, but uh, what what about you, Henrietta? What do you think? I think, uh, like everybody has been saying, well, particularly Michael and David about this the 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 collective near-death experience. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's where we're going, but, but I do think we have to um, make an enormous effort and engage and engage ourselves in, in any which way we can to help other people and the planet, you know, so whether that's through, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, sort of super paranormal powers or just um you know <laughs> giving people things i i think it requires a huge effort in every which way we can i mean that's but that's what i want to do is is to engage as much as possible and joyously you know even mm. though you know it might seem a little um impossible <laughs> mm. <laughs> right mm. yeah so, so, so effort my... is required <laughs> yeah. yeah so so, Michael uh, Grosso, wh wh where do we go with all this? What's your, like, um, uh, conclusion? How do we proceed? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I don't know, because I'm doing it, trying to figure it out my own life from day to day and, and you know, how, how to live. And, and uh, but um, there are many ways, you know, and, and I just, I don't have a, a, a single uh, right. uh plan or idea i think things things are going to unfold and the more information we have and uh, the more we relate to each other in ways that are uh loving and caring and positive 
uh, it, it will happen of its own accord. And, mm. and uh, it, the science of it is interesting. I just had lunch with, a, with one of my colleagues, Ed, Ed uh, Kelly, who's writing a massive paper on uh, on much uh, on the nature of the mind and, and, and for an anthology that includes mostly neuroscientists who don't believe in the paranormal. And uh, it, it's, it's a heroic effort that he's making and he's the guy, he can do it. He's got the stuff, he knows the stuff and he can, he's a good, damn good writer too. But I also think it's, uh, it's a challenging task because they, they, they're, they won't, they're not being rational. They're so fixated on their, we're going back to what we started. We were talking about this right. early. So there's that big problem. And uh, he, he, should, he should talk to Eben Alexander, who was a neuroscientist who had a oh, near yeah. death. Yeah, but how many neuroscientists have that kind of experience that, right. that uh, Eben Alexander had? Right. That, that, but, that's the thing. But maybe it comes down to just accepting the paranormal, at least we, at least I do, uh, mm -hmm. as as normal in a sense it's i mean it's another level it's you know i've seen miracles i've seen babuti appear i've seen you yeah. know yeah. yeah in india and it's like well it's it, it, let's accept it and try to integrate that into a new world view that welcomes but mm. you know the the rational you know Ed, ken wilbur says you know there is the pre-rationalists who who, who worship mountains and stars as gods and then there were the rationalists who said no no that's nonsense you can't do it and the post-rationalists say no there are energies out there and we can recognize them it doesn't mean you need you, you need to lose your rationality mm -hmm. because these other things are included except the rationalists think the post-rationalists are the pre-rationalists, you know, they, so it's like that. It's like, how do we convince the linear folks that there's more to reality than just their left brain, that they're only functioning with half their minds? And I, I think-, think it's a matter of luck, frankly. I think what's that? Luck. And luck. if you happen to, uh, uh, there's another, I have a view, I'll just throw this out. Uh, I do think that, different people are just physically constituted. Their brains are physically constituted in ways that by chance enable them to be receptive to things that others, no matter what their intentions are or their character, they're never gonna get it. I happen, I, I don't know this, but my guess is that, I mean, why are some people receptive to uh, paranormal, spiritual, mystical, aesthetic stimuli in dramatic and potent ways. And other people are just um, flatly indifferent or imperfect. Mm. A lot has to, could very well be with this, we don't know enough about this, but the structure of our brains, uh, the, the, uh, the elasticity of our, of our bodily uh, uh, capacities may have mm. something to do with it. And it may simply be a matter of chance. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course you can increase chance too by, by mm. behaving in certain ways. You can increase the chances that you will have one of these encounters. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed and difficult picture. We're talking about 8 billion people on this planet <laughs> and they're all different. <laughs> right. Uh, one more thing. What what's coming up for you? You're going to be speaking at Contact in the Desert online. Anything else that you could leave us with? Um, uh, that, that, those, those folks involved with that particular uh, event mm -hmm. have gotten me in touch with a bunch of people. So I got a bunch of talks coming up. Great. But I'm looking forward to the uh, to this uh, desert uh, thing. And um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I. I uh, and initially, we were supposed to um, record, pre-record your... Right. I had a hard time doing that. I wrote a perfect essay, and I tried to read it, and, well, but I, I was unable to. So I was a lot... She's told me, uh, the woman in charge there, um, that I can just rap, just give, my, give a talk. Right. If you want, if you want to me to help you to do with something, and what were you going to say, Henrietta? What were you saying? 
Oh, I just had a question for Michael. Um, I'm just, is there any way that we can, a way to look at your paintings? Because I've been looking oh, at you, yes. with pieces oh, oh, yeah. of your paintings and I'm longing to see what you create. Oh, I do. It's quite easy. Just uh, paintingthepsyche.com. Oh, okay. okay, great. It, it's my <laughs> website, but I, I, I produced that with the help of a woman that was very sophisticated with computers and all of that stuff. And then we sort of split up. And mm -hmm. so it's sitting there, I'm not doing anything, but it's, it's got a lot of paintings. I have to figure out ways to get people to go. Mm -hmm. And I wanna write stuff for it so that Ooh. it'll be, get more traffic. But yeah, you can see yeah. a, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of my uh, art uh, oh, there. Good. good. Okay, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll post a link to that from this interview. And, and definitely let's do this another time. Um, you know, this has been, a really fun two hours, really. And yeah. um, we, uh, actually, I have an idea, Alan, too. To, what's to, to, if Michael was to return, we could have another a guest, you know, and it'd oh, be yeah. fun to get kind of more conversations with. And, and we could show his paintings, and you could talk about your paintings next time, too, Michael. Yes. Well, I'm, trying, I'm trying to combine uh, uh, the parapsychological research with, with the art. And I think. That's yes, yeah, I, I, I think for example, I did a, I, I, made, I did a portrait of Sai Baba. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that, that creates that babuti. Babuti, yeah, Ash, yeah. A, a great job on his hairdo, <laughs> fabulous hairdo, okay? And so I've got this painting up and after I finished, it's a pretty good painting, by the way. It's not a great one, but it's all right. And I said, Sai Baba, do you think? I'm waiting. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I meant that in a serious way. Uh, so I painted this painting in the hopes that it would produce babuti. So mm -hmm. far, no luck. But anyway, so there are other ways I'm exploring how art and the paranormal. Partly, oh. the way I paint is, is a well, kind well, of... Well, Hilma of Clint, if you saw that show at the Guggenheim, that was a... She was channeling those paintings, basically. Huh. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. I'll send you a paper I wrote about that. Oh, cool. But yeah. Yeah. Also, I was going to say if you need help, if you want someone to interview you, sort of for Contact in the Desert and make it that style, I'm, I'm available to do that because I'm, I, I, I'm helping those guys organize yeah. some of that. Okay. Well, let, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone online. We had a really active chat today. Um, uh, lots of people, uh, yeah, lots of you. So this was, yeah, let's keep going. And, and every week we kind of, kind of dance around this sort of theme of mind and consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come on just as one of the gallery people, uh, next week, even Michael, I'll, I'll invite you. Okay. I'll keep you, I'll keep you in touch. I enjoyed very much meeting you guys and, uh, I, I look forward to doing it again. So, Definitely, and being we'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone, for being right. here. Yet I'll, talk you. To you. Thanks, yeah. I'll talk to you. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael, oh. for all your stories. You know, all those mm. interesting personal stories, because that's yes. for me. Like, even though you're obviously extremely knowledgeable about historical texts and narratives, your own personal experiences were were, were extremely mm. fascinating to mm. me. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we'll talk about my book too. Take a look when you get a chance. And sure. that book coming out May 4th, I'll just tell everyone is Making Contact. Alan Steinfeld, Henrietta has an essay there. So does Whitley Strieber, Linda Moulton Howe. Real good. That's Grant, cool. Yeah, right. it's, it's an overview of the phenomena. And it's more about consciousness, what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, David, Michael, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Alan right. Steinfeld for New Realities. Tomorrow, I'm interviewing Whitley Strieber, Linda Moulton Howe, and JJ and Desiree Hurtock. So check in tomorrow, 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Oh, that, right. on, new, on New Realities. So, yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's exciting, Alan. Thank yeah. you. Or Take Portal care. to Ascension. You could sign up there.